Not only do I think Mank is the best film of 2020, but I think it might be the best film David Fincher has ever made. I'm not saying Mank is my personal favorite Fincher film. It might be, but that's a harder choice and might take a lifetime to figure out. But after spending much time with Mank, I have to conclude that it's his most complex, challenging, and most personal film. And that it is, without a doubt, a masterpiece. It took me several viewings to understand the many strands of story, depth, and meaning. No doubt most people don't want to spend that kind of time studying a movie. And that is why Mank won't win Best Picture. And why Citizen Kane didn't win Best Picture. Oscar winners have to be gotten in one go. They have to be movies you can sit anyone down in front of, and they will get it, if not love it. But movies that take time to get to know, to revisit over the years, those are the ones that stand the test of time. Because they age as you age, as culture shifts, and more of them is excavated, unearthed, and understood as the years go by. So, what do I love about Mank? I love that it's a movie about a movie. It's a movie about writing a movie. But because it's David Fincher, it isn't just the story of the making of Citizen Kane, the greatest film of all time. It's also about the cinema of Citizen Kane. And that might be the thing I love about it the most. Orson Welles. Of course it is. I think it's time we talked. I'm all ears. Each frame of this film is a shot so beautifully composed it could be hung in a gallery. And the film itself is so tightly wound, but once you untangle it and you separate out the strands and you look at the entirety of the whole picture, the whole picture reveals itself. I love that the cinematography of Meg is on par with Greg Tolan's cinematography in Citizen Kane, which was groundbreaking and influential, even almost a century later. I love that David Fincher finally made the movie his dad wrote 30 years ago. I love it that the film is not just a tribute to his father, but to his father's love of movies, and the kinds of movies his father loved. Old movies, black and white movies, movies where people walked, talked, dressed a certain way. It was the training the actors received on dialect, posture, movement. This was before acting was revolutionized by the method with people like Marlon Brando. These were also movies that cost 10 cents and offered a safe haven from the depression. I love it that it's about failure and how we cope with never having achieved anything we wanted in life and that our success was overshadowed by the success of others. You ungrateful bastard! I oughta cut your balls off! Do it, you fucking junk dealer! I'll still be the better man! Here, Herman J. Mankiewicz, a.k.a. Mank, was the less successful brother to Joe Mankiewicz, who won an Oscar for All About Eve. Mank was known for drinking too much and gambling away all of his income. But people liked him, and that counted for a lot back then. I love that it's about addiction. It's about alcoholism and how that ultimately destroyed Mank's potential. He was the life of the party until he threw up all over the furniture. And he knew it, but he couldn't stop. And the same was true of Marion Davies, who would also die of complications from alcoholism. David Fincher hints at this in the film, showing each of them drinking, and even drinking together, but never really needing to explain what happens at the end of the story, when both of them outlive their life of the party status and sink into middle age, where your body can't really tolerate alcohol in the same way. Isn't that right, Louis? So what do we do? Anybody? 
We give him ideals. Ideals that any dirt, poor, depression-weary audience can identify with. But Mank was an alcoholic, but he was also a gambler. And his desire to gamble, to make big, impossible bets, which is seen throughout the film, is also probably the reason, or at least one of the reasons, why he decided to take such a big risk and expose his friend, William Randolph Hearst, and his mistress, Marion Davies. How about double or nothing? What's he saying? Herman. You really will bet on anything. Keep your money. I'm happy enough just to nail that utopian son of a bitch to the wall. I told you, your obligation was canceled out of gratitude. Wait a minute, what? He wants to wage a double or nothing on a debt he doesn't even owe us? Mink. It's a matter of principle, LB. You wouldn't understand. I understand plenty. I'll take that bet. OK, man, you're on. 24 grand or nothing. Excuse me? I'm going to throw up. Without being the kind of guy who gambles away every paycheck on a risky bet, why would you want to risk everything to go with the king? And as we know, if you go with the king, you best not miss. <laughs> Mank is David Fincher's response to Citizen Kane, both thematically and cinematically. And to understand Mank, you have to understand Kane. But let's start at the beginning. What's Mank about? A 24-year-old wonder king named Orson Welles did a sci-fi spectacular radio broadcast called War of the Worlds, where he and his team of actors called the Mercury Players fooled half the country that we were being invaded by Martians. Because of this, he was given the golden key to Hollywood and invited to make any movie he wanted. That movie would turn out to be Citizen Kane. For much of my life, I believed Orson Welles was the once-in-a-lifetime genius who really did come up with a movie as great as Citizen Kane all on his own. I knew there was a co-writer named Herman J. Mankiewicz, who had also won the movie's only Oscar, but I assumed it sprang from the fertile loins of Welles and Welles alone. My mother should have chosen a less reliable banker. Well... I always gagged on that silver spoon. You know, Mr. Bernstein, if I hadn't been very rich, I might have been a really great man. But other people weren't so sure, film critic Pauline Kael being one of them. She wrote an infamous essay leaning heavily on actor John Hausman to tell the tale of that time Wells trapped Mankiewicz out in Victorville in a dry house to ensure he wrote the script for Citizen Kane, without distractions, without a bar, and without gambling temptations. From then on, the debate has raged as to who wrote the script, or rather, who should get credit for the script. But let's just get this out of the way now. Make is not a movie about who should take credit for writing the greatest film of all time. It's more about the guy who co-wrote that script, that leaned heavily on his experiences hanging out with the wealthy tycoon Hearst and his mistress Davies. Wells didn't know any of that, so he could not have written it. I also don't think any 24-year-old would have had the kind of wisdom embedded in the story of Kane. But there wouldn't be a Citizen Kane without Orson Welles, or cinematographer Greg Toland, or Herman J. Mankiewicz. Mank is Kane's superhero origin story. It both reveals the impetus to write the script, speculative fiction though it may be, and the driving force behind it. It is about how the truth can be the most effective weapon against the powerful who seek to use every tool at their disposal to suppress it. Citizen Kane is about a very powerful man whose life was ultimately a pointless quest to learn the hard lesson that money can buy a lot of things, but it can't buy love, it can't buy respect, it can't buy friendship. But it's also about a man who betrays his own statement of principles who backtracks on every vow he's ever made, and in the end sells himself out to serve his massive empire and maintain control over the people in his life. The reason so many people love Citizen Kane and why it resonates today is that America has never run out of people who use money to buy things. And also because it is about how absolute power corrupts absolutely. Needless to say, Hearst didn't like it one bit that Wells made this movie or that Mank wrote it. 
You're in a tent, darling. You aren't at home. I can hear you very well if you speak in a normal tone of voice. What's the difference between giving me a bracelet or giving somebody else $100,000 for a statue you're going to keep crated up and never even look at? It's just money. It doesn't mean anything. You never really give me anything that belongs to you, that you care about. Susan, I want you to stop this. I'm not going to stop it. Right now. You never gave me anything in your whole life. You just tried to buy me into giving you something. Susan! Just name it and it's yours. But you gotta love me. <laughs> Don't tell me you're sorry. I'm not sorry. It could be argued that the person who suffered the worst from Citizen Kane, though, was Marion Davies who was portrayed as a talentless trophy wife foisted upon the public until she could not take it anymore and attempted suicide just to get out of it. The real Davies didn't like that Hearst tried to make her career happen with too many embarrassing billboards and films that were showcases for her but really dressed her up in ways that never suited her comedic, goofy personality. Mank rescues Davies from that myth and revives her as someone not only human, not only smart and funny, but also someone whose relationship with Hearst was the real deal. She was hardly talentless, and they loved each other until his death, unlike Susan Alexander in the movie Who Leaves Kane, which is, of course, how we get the best scene in the film. But dishing on Hearst and Davies wasn't really enough to make Citizen Kane what it was. No, there was anger behind that script and that character. There was a sense of betrayal. And Mank, written by Jack Fincher, David Fincher's dad, takes a stab at what that might have been. And here is where the story gets dense and complicated. Not that it already wasn't dense and complicated. Remind me never again to work with a washed up alcoholic. Duly noted, Nelson Algren, please copy. All right. No doubt you'll get your credit, but ask yourself, who's producing this picture, directing it, starring in it? That's just what we need when Susan leaves came. There is a lot to take in, like, Louis B. Mayer and the star system in the Depression, like the writers from the Algonquin Roundtable dragged to Hollywood by Mank to write popcorn movies. But the story of Upton Sinclair and Frank Miriam is really what drives the idea that Hearst did something so unforgivable that he deserved to be taken down in a movie that would haunt his reputation forever. Upton Sinclair was a socialist who famously wrote a manifesto of sorts called End Poverty in California, Epic. But the rich were never going to allow a guy like Sinclair to get elected. He was the Bernie Sanders of his day, someone who shook the establishment tree just a little bit too much. What Manx sees, though, is how Hearst bought off the studio, MGM, to make phony propaganda reels to trick voters using xenophobia and smears into voting for Frank Merriam, the Republican. This kind of corruption invades the soul of the character Shelley, the writer who gets a chance to direct, but who can't take it after he realizes he was responsible for helping to rig an election for the power elite against the candidate of his choice, and he blows his brains out. That is part of why Mank goes at the king, but there is another reason. Probably the movie's best scene, in my view, is the power play between Mank, who is drunk and out of control at one of Hearst's ridiculous parties where they're all dressed up in circus costumes, dresses down Hearst and Davies in front of all their guests, calling them out and Louis B. Mayer for destroying the lives of people who just didn't matter to them. Hearst, the once self-described man of the people, who was prepared to hold the powerful accountable, was now exactly the thing he used to rail against. But Manx's tirade, complete with vomiting on the floor in front of all of their party guests, was a bridge too far. The minute Charles Dance, as Hearst, looks at Mank, that is when you know this is the end. Yeah. 
Don't worry, folks. The white wine came up with a fish. Who the fuck do you think you are, Mankowitz? You're nothing but a court jester. And let me let you in on a little secret. Do you have any idea who pays half your salary? He pays half your fucking salary. Him, your fucking ingrate. You didn't know that, did you? You want to know why? Because he likes the way you talk. Not the way you write, the way you talk. Don't that chap your ass. The beauty of the sequence is how Fincher sets the hallway alight as the two of them make their trek down the exit of Hearst Castle. Hearst, completely done with Mank by now, bids him goodbye, wipes his hands of him, and tosses him casually aside like an unwanted delivery boy. And he's paired with a fine gilt music box on an exquisite gold chain fastened to his neck. And he's necked alone. Whenever he ventures into the city to perform, he thinks, what a powerful fellow I must be. Look how patiently everyone waits just to watch me dance. Willie. Really? And wherever I go, he thinks, this music box must follow, and with it, this poor downtrodden man. And if I chose not to dance, this sorry street peddler would starve. And every time I do decide to dance, every time. He must play, whether he wishes to or not. You've had a bit too much to drink, Herman. I'll get Raymond to drive you to the station. Goodbye. The pen is mightier than the sword. All Mank needed was a green light and a director with brass balls to make a movie like Citizen Kane. The beauty of this film, though, is quite simply its beauty. How Marion Davies' dress catches the light, the shadows, the smoke, the incredible score, the crisp, clean editing. Everything about Mank's life both destroys and inspires him. He sees too much. He knows too much and no amount of alcohol can numb the pain. At the end of the film, when Mank is clutching his Oscar, just a few years before alcohol finally took him under at the age of 55, I see Fincher's father, Jack, a guy whose success was never going to be measured by one screenplay, but who had an idea once and wrote a movie. He bothered his director's son to make it, but he never did, not until after his dad died, not until 30 years later. But Fincher still made the movie, for the same reasons that every May, brave people decide to climb Mount Everest, because it's there and because it's nearly impossible. There is such sweetness in Mank, all through it, though Fincher is always accused of coldness in his films, as Hitchcock was. Warmth is there if you know how to recognize it. Here, it's the women who surround Mank, each of them with their own story, but without whom Mank could never have written Citizen Kane. In the end, Mank had what matters most, what comes through loudly in Citizen Kane is a strong sense of personal failure. It's clear this is how Mank regarded his life, wasted on drink and gambling, while his brother Joe flourished in the studio system. But the film Mank gives back a sense of accomplishment to the legacy of Herman J. Mankiewicz, because even if he never wrote another script that important, he had the one thing Kane never did. He had his wife, Sarah, he had love. I speak aboard an Albuquerque and climb into your compartment naked. I also remember how I spent my honeymoon in Berlin with hookers running up and down the stairs all night because my dashing correspondent couldn't afford a nice hotel. Boy, those are the days. Yeah, yeah. And the nights weren't bad either. Schnitz. For the last time, what? What year is it? Herman. I should have done something by now. Give me a sign, oh Lord, I, I... We might not have much to pull our country together after this year, but we still have people who are willing to throw down to make art. And not just art that entertains or soothes or patches over the rough spots, but art that tells the truth. Besides, her pictures haven't made a dime in a decade. 
Congratulations, Irving. I know what I am, Mank. When I come to work, I don't consider it slumming. I don't use humor to keep myself above the fray, and I always go to the mat for what I believe in. I haven't the time to do otherwise. But you, sir, how formidable people like you might be if they actually gave at the office. I'm washed up, Joe. I've been for years. It's the best thing you've ever written. Art you never forget. A rare bird, that. A Mankiewicz. that leaves a mark.